was the Nasrallah attack justified under international law? On Friday, September 27, 2024, Israeli Air Force F-15Is from the 69th Squadron, or Hammers, struck Beirut's Dahia neighborhood. And their target was an underground Hezbollah command and control bunker. Six other buildings were also struck in subsequent attacks, including depots or other weapons and equipment were hidden. The weapons were most likely GBU-31s, which is a precision-guided 2,000-pound bomb, essentially bunker busters. Reportedly, 83 tons of bombs were used, but this sounds like a bigger number than it actually is because that works out to maybe 41, 42 munitions of the 2,000-pound range, although most likely different munitions were of differing power. Casualties included Hassan Nasrallah, the Secretary General of Hezbollah, along with approximately 100 or so other senior leaders and perhaps up to 200 or so civilian casualties. The command center was situated under a residential building. Of course, the, uh, the memes started a few minutes later. And if you follow me, you'll notice that I didn't participate in that. I, you know, I, I'm the guy that finds the people to target. I write software. I write software that finds people. I develop a pattern of life. I know where they work. I know where they sleep. I know their driver's cell phone. I know they get chauffeured around in a white SUV with a dent on the right rear quarter panel. And then I give all that information to my client and they take it from there. Now, I don't do the legal part. Lawyers do that. Uh, I also don't do the weaponeering where you decide which weapon to use. That's a whole different job. But when I'm told that the strike was successful, I don't laugh about it. I don't joke about it. I don't post memes about it. I go home. I crack open a beer. I order a pizza. And I watch the Washington Wizards. And the next day I go into work and I find the next target. After the attacks, uh, the chair in computational biology systems at the University of College London, a man named Professor uh, Francois Ballou, said something on X, formerly known as Twitter, that just kind of rubbed me wrong. He said, whether the IDF suspected that Nasrallah was in this block of flats that got flattened or just made up a story, it is largely irrelevant. This is a war crime either way. So I took a look at Professor Ballou. He didn't seem to have any legal or military experience. He's just an academic. And at this, uh, I pointed this out and he blocked me, which <laughs> that's cute. I'm Ryan Macbeth, bub. <laughs> I use the Twitter API and I also use Cyabra for social media threat detection. Oh, uh, so one funny thing to note, um, the, the good professor actually reposted a reply to a tweet from a person who I guess supposedly sent out some inaccurate COVID information saying, if it's not your expertise, consult experts and do not make your conclusions and provide context. Well, Professor, I'm the guy that provides context. Class is now in session. But before I provide context on how Israel's strike on Nasrallah is not a war crime, let me talk about another organization that provides context, and that's Ground News. So it's literally the day of a massive missile attack on Israel from Iran. While I was editing this video, this thing happened. So, of course, I go to Ground News. I use the Ground News app every day to stay informed as part of my morning routine. I even purchased it before they were a sponsor. I think it's a great tool. Ground News is a news aggregator. It takes a look at all these sources from the left, from the center, and from the right. And it has a biased comparison. And this biased comparison lets you see how the left, the center, and the right are focusing on different things in news coverage. And if you go to ground.news slash Ryan you can get the Vantage plan for 40% off. Which is the plan that I personally use. And I want to show you something that's kind of neat. Ground News actually breaks down your consumption of news, and I normally consume centrist news. I'm a centrist, imagine that. But here's what's kind of neat. There's also this blind spot report. Which shows you stories that you could have missed because of your own personal biases. And Ground News also gives you the ownership data and the factuality rating of the news sources that you consume. So you can learn who wants you to believe what. So go to ground.news slash Ryan McBeth to get 40% off the Vantage plan. Okay, now I gotta get back to editing this video. Okay, we have to start by defining what is and is not a valid and lawful target. Now, there's generally four types of valid targets. There are combatants. These are enemy soldiers and fighters who are directly participating in hostilities. 
There's military infrastructure, which are facilities, uh, installations, equipment that can be used for military purposes, such as barracks, uh, air bases, naval ships, weapons factories, and command centers. And we have supply lines and logistics, bridges, railways, other infrastructure directly supporting military operations. And we have weapons and ammunition. That's kind of a given. Stockpiles, weapon systems, logistical support facilities. Now note that there are some things that are never valid targets, unless there are some very specific exceptions. To start, civilians and civilian infrastructure. They are generally protected unless civilians are directly involved in hostilities. The law of armed conflict does not preclude militaries from firing into civilian locations if it can be proven that the adversary is using civilians for cover. And that was certainly the case here. Remember, Nasrallah was in a bunker underneath a residential building. Another item are medical personnel facilities. So we're talking hospitals, medical personnel, vehicles that are clearly marked as medical vehicles are protected unless they are being used to commit acts that are harmful to the enemy. Third item is cultural, religious, and historic sites. So we're talking about sites of significant cultural or religious importance. The, those are typically protected under international law. So we're talking about the Taj Mahal, the Eiffel Tower, those sort of monuments. And finally, surrendering combatants and prisoners of war, they are protected as well. Once someone has surrendered, or they're no longer able to fight or decombat, they cannot be targeted. Now, note that, that or, or decombat means out of action due to illness or injury. Just being wounded does not mean that you're or decombat. You can still attack a wounded soldier. So now that we have the absolute baseline, let's take a look at this actual bunker and how we would approach this. So you've got a top-level Hezbollah commander and a hundred of his main dudes who is deep underground and meeting with other commanders. And meanwhile, roughly 90,000 Israelis have been internally displaced because Hezbollah has fired over 8,000 rockets into northern Israel since October 7th, 2023. Could taking out this commander and a hundred of his dudes become a shaping operation, meaning he, could this set the IDF up for, for a future attack which would reduce the number of rockets that are falling onto northern Israel? So if the answer to that is yes, now the question changes to, are we going to get another chance at this? If the target is in a populated area, are there other options? Can we take this target out in a different place? Now, ideally, after you develop a pattern of life, you want to try to hit the bad guy in a way that minimizes civilian casualties. For example, uh, if you can take out uh, the bad guy uh, when he's meeting at a secluded farmhouse with other bad guys, that's ideal. That's what you want to do. Um, but you might be able to take him out while they're driving, but preferably you wait for an area of low traffic. Like if he is Leaving the farmhouse, maybe you hit him while he's on the driveway of the farmhouse before he actually gets out into traffic. And this is kind of where the weaponeering comes into play. You tailor the weapon system to the threat. Uh, if there's a single car on the road, maybe you use a Hellfire missile. If there's a meeting in that farmhouse, maybe you use a 1,000-pound bomb. If there's a meeting in an underground bunker, well, now you got to get messy because you got to penetrate all that earth and concrete to get to the bunker. Now again, weaponeering isn't my job. It's more complex than what I just described, but those are the basics. Now I also want to bring in the principle of NCV, or non-combatant cutoff value. People like to claim that one civilian life negates any action at all, but that's just not true. NCV is the number of civilians that you are legally allowed as collateral damage in order to strike the target. Yes, this exists. 99% of the time, the NCV is zero. You can't hit anyone who isn't a bad guy. But if you have an NCV of five, and there's four civilians around the bad guy, and you're not going to get another chance at this, and then you go home, crack open a beer, order a pizza, and watch the Washington Wizards. Now, if the NCV is five, and there's actually six dudes there and six civilians, then you have to call your higher command and they will either approve or disapprove the strike and 99% of the time they disapprove the strike. Uh, lawyers are part of this process. 
every single step of the way. And what lawyers are looking for are two things, military necessity and proportionality. Now, military necessity permits attacks on military objectives that are essential for achieving a legitimate military advantage. A high value target typically qualifies as a military objective if its destruction, its capture or neutralization offers a concrete and direct military advantage. However, the use of force must be limited to what is necessary to achieve that advantage. Unnecessary or excessive force that does not contribute to the military goal is prohibited. Now, it's hard to argue that Hassan Nasrallah, being the secretary freaking general of Hezbollah, was not a high value target. So, next we have to talk about proportionality. And this is where most civilians actually get things wrong. When people think of proportionality, they think, oh, if the, the bad guy is a knife, you have to use a knife. It's proportional. If you use a gun, it's no longer proportional. That is the way wrong way to think about the problem. Proportionality means that the attack must not result in excessive civilian harm compared to the anticipated military advantage. For example, if the expected civilian casualties are high related to the military value of the target, the attack might be considered unlawful. And I'll give you an example. Let's say you got one Hezbollah fighter standing in a marketplace with a whole bunch of civilians, and he's just a regular dude. He's just a regular Hezbollah fighter, not in the chain of command. Would I drop a 2,000-pound bomb on that guy? Probably not. I'm not going to wipe out an entire freaking marketplace just to get at some low-level dude. But would I drop a 2,000 pound bomb on a bunch of Taliban who are standing around uh, preparing to attack a base and there's no civilians around? Yeah, probably, if that's all I had available in the air at the time. And, and note that, at least during the global war on terror, aircraft might have different loadouts, so you might try to tailor the ordnance to the threat. But if time is of the essence and there's no civilians around, shoot, drop what you got, right? So this gets us back to the main question. Was this attack a war crime? The answer is no. And the reason is that the nature of the target outweighed the possible civilian loss of life. And if that makes you angry, I want you to understand something. The GBU in GBU-31 means guided bomb unit. These are bombs that are guided by GPS. The JDAM, or Joint Direct Attack Munition, of which the GBU-31 is a part of the family, has a circular error probability of less than 1.7 meters. For comparison, I'm five foot nine, about 1.75 meters tall. The Israelis made every effort to minimize casualties when it came to hitting the exact target they were aiming at, but they had to use a bigger weapon to penetrate all those layers of concrete. However, the rockets that Hezbollah fires into Israel, the Katushas, uh, the Fahir variants, they're unguided. They're what I call Inshallah guidance. Inshallah, it hits the military target, but sometimes it hits a bunch of Drew's kids playing soccer. Inshallah. So, Professor, you might be hanging out with the wrong friends. You know, I, uh, I fight disinformation for a living. And I'm like coffee in the green mile. I'm tired, boss. I'm tired. I'm tired of these ivory tower professors who never served in the military and don't know a darn thing about the military putting out misinformation about military operations. So if you could just kind of stop spreading misinformation, that would be great. And just as a notice to everybody else out there who wants to spread misinformation, especially when it comes to those who worship at the altar of destruction, I find people, and I'll find you. Special thanks to Syabra for allowing me to use their social media threat detection software, and thank you so much for watching. Oh, wow, Daddy cigarettes. If I smoke these, I'll be cool. Hey, kid, what are you doing? Tank. You know, kids, smoking isn't cool, but t-shirts, stickers, and hoodies from Bunker Branding sure are. Wow! Alcoholics moving cargo! Awesome! Intel Life, Aerosol, 
Live, Laugh, Launch for Destroyer, Trident, High Mars, and Patriot. Think outside the bomb. Drone Sweet Drone, Department of the Boat People, Landmines, and even the tow missile. It would behoove you to grab one today. I better take these. Don't worry, I'll destroy them by burning. And remember, bunker branding is cool. Now I know. And knowing is half the battle. Bunker branding!